Hey, it's Mike here, and today another video looking at recent vegan studies that I think are really interesting and worth hearing about, but probably don't need an entire video to themselves. Also, yes, I am wearing this colorful shirt that a lot of people said was too colorful and annoying and that I shouldn't wear again in a previous video. Well, I'm wearing it. It's comfortable. Now you guys can start a pro and anti-shirt people war in the comments, but this is gonna be some interesting studies, like one on low carb vegan diets, another one that does a bit of like a vegan test to see if somebody is vegan or not. We had a previous study on that that didn't make the cut, but this one looks like it might actually be able to do it, which is super interesting. We have some social science related studies, like one on food tribes. We have a bunch of health related studies, one on B12, for example. And I'm also excited to introduce two which is going to be today's delicious sponsor that we'll briefly cover later on, but let's just go. All right, now let's start off on the topic of sort of vegan social studies. And the first study is out of Saudi Arabia, which interestingly claims that 5% of people surveyed identified as vegan. Does that mean 5% of Saudi Arabia is vegan? I don't know, that would be pretty crazy. About 8% identified as vegetarians, but in terms of those vegans, I mean, it shows that masculinity is especially associated with meat over there because 80% of these vegans were women and 78% of them were young people under the age of 30. And then they asked why people decided to adopt their specific diet. And for the vegans, the number one one was actually animal ethics at 37%. But that's a little bit misleading. If you add health and weight loss groups together, you reach 50%. Also, vegan for weight loss, a little bit weak, but I understand with all the claims that are made and the fact that vegans have a lower BMI on average. However, that vegan group had a higher proportion of underweight people. It wasn't like all of them or anything, but this could mean that people with eating disorders are using veganism to mask it. But let's move on to the next one, which has to do with hashtag food blogger as a category on Twitter. You might be like, why are you talking about this? Well, the hashtag vegan did quite well where they were sort of ranking hashtags. They looked at like 700,000 tweets over the course of the last five years. And they say that the most communicated hashtags in the food blogger sphere were as follows, hashtag yummy, hashtag healthy, hashtag homemade, and hashtag vegan. My friends Angie and Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan have hit two out of three of those popular hashtags. <laughs> they also looked at how different dietary pattern hashtags were associated, and you can see from this chart that vegan was about 30 times more popular than low carb. Take that, however, it is worth mentioning that they didn't put keto in there. Probably would have been more popular. Either way, vegans winning. Okay, now to the next one on food tribes, which is definitely from like a sociological perspective. And they looked at a few different tribes, which kind of made me laugh because it included veganism, fruitarianism, raw food diet, paleo diet, blood type group, breatharianism, macrobiotic diet, and other. Unfortunately, none of the breatharian people were able to live long enough to actually get an answer from the survey from unfortunate. But for the most interesting result, in my opinion, quote, vegan people were less conditioned by others in their food choices when compared to the other food tribes. Yeah, the vegans were the least conditionable, further proof that veganism is not a cult. I mean, have you ever tried to get vegans to do anything? It's like herding cats, only less cute. It's probably because to be a vegan, you have to fight against all of these norms of society and food culture. You gotta be like a vegan warrior when going something like paleo is like, oh, just eat more of the meat that everybody's telling you to eat anyway. Conditioned. All right, next up, we got the health topic in general here in a bunch of studies, the first of which is a B12 level study from Norway looking at vegans and vegetarians. The results were, quote, B12 status were adequate in both vegans and vegetarians according to the CB12 indicator. However, 4% had elevated B12. And because most people probably aren't aware, CB12 is a sort of combined index of B12 status considered to be better. It looks at total B12, holotranscobalamin, and homocysteine, and adjusts for age and folate status. Other connected markers like methylmalonic acid were not different between groups. Anyway, this adds to the recent growing body of studies showing that vegans do not have lower B12 levels than other dietary groups. All right, now it's time to take a quick break with our sponsor for today, Toodaloo, which is a super adaptogen loaded, eco-friendly trail mix and a bunch of delicious flavors. And their packaging is beautiful and recycled plastic. Look at that. And the reason I was so excited about this is because 
everyone's gonna snack and you can just grab a normal snack, like a normal trail mix or a granola or something, or you can get one that's loaded with a bunch of super healthy ingredients, ones that I've made entire videos on. You know, like ashwagandha, which is in the slow your roll, which is personally my favorite, and also things like turmeric and lion's mane, which I'm gearing up to do a video on. And they have four awesome flavors that I want to quickly award. <laughs> Slow Your Roll, I think, has the best initial punch of flavor. Smoke Show is the most addictively delicious. Turning Heads, these cacao-covered ones, have the best crunch. And Hot to Trot wins for the most whole food. And I also like how each one of these is geared to help your health in some way. For example, Hot to Trot, support gut health on the bottom. And we've got Slow Your Roll, something I generally need to work on has uh, supporting relaxation, which looking at ashwagandha, which is in here. Yes, there is a lot of research showing that ashwagandha supports relaxation. And if you wanna try it, you can go to my link at toodaloo.com slash Mike below, and you will automatically get $5 off your first purchase at checkout. Or if you go a different route, you can use the code Mike, M-I-C. Thank you, toodaloo. Moving on to the next one, which is this one, another study claiming to have a method to test if people are vegan or not. And I previously mentioned a study that did hair samples, joking that if you wanna test if your partner is actually vegan or lying to you, you can snip some hair in their sleep. Now though, the new study relies on pee samples. Yes, urine samples. So now you have to be even more weird than you already are and find a way to steal their pee. Well, the study only looked at 36 vegans and 36 non-vegans. They still claim that through particularly the Delta 15N ratio, they were able to determine with 100% accuracy if somebody was vegan or not. And Delta 15N is a ratio between isotopes of nitrogen between 15N and 14N to get nerdy. But now vegan employers can actually do screenings, sort of like drug screenings, where they take urine samples to make sure that their employees are actually vegan. Heck, low carb companies could even do this to make sure that their employees are not secretly vegan all of a sudden. I am totally joking, but if there was a vegan cult, I could totally see them using this method. <laughs> anyway, moving on. And now for the next health study, which is this review slash meta-analysis on people who have obesity and insulin resistance being put on plant-based diets. We're talking six studies, most of which are randomized control trials. And the findings are, quote, in obese individuals with insulin resistance, a vegan diet improves insulin resistance and dyslipidemia, except for triglycerides. I'd have to do a further investigation to figure out what's going on with that triglycerides, but obviously we see a great drop in LDL and on and on. So let's move on to the next one, which is this study, another review on peripheral artery disease, which is really just reduced blood flow to the limbs due to the narrowing of arteries in general throughout the body. The study investigates different diets and their effects, and they have a whole massive section on plant-based diet. It includes vegetarian and vegan diets, and they open with, quote, adopting a vegetarian diet or completely avoiding proteins of animal origin, as in a whole plant-based diet, have documented protection against the development of major cardiovascular risk factors with a modest increase in longevity. And one topic I haven't specifically looked in that sounds interesting, they say, quote, an interesting and relatively new aspect is the effect of a vegan diet on adipokines, which have been observed as a promising target for counteracting the metabolic syndrome. For those that don't know, adipokines, AKA adipocytokines, are cell signaling molecules produced by the adipose tissue that play functional roles in energy slash metabolic status of the body, inflammation, obesity, etc. Let's move on to the next one, which is this study on colorectal cancer and plant-based diet indexes. Indices, I don't know. They looked at 2,800 people who had colorectal cancer and then 2,800 controls. And they found that total plant-based diet index and healthy plant-based diet index were associated with lower colorectal cancer. Well, unhealthy plant-based index increases it. Who would have thought we're talking about things like soda? But there's an important distinction that needs to be made here. And that is in response to people who say, Oh, look, unhealthy plant-based diets can lead to worse outcomes. Therefore, don't even bother going vegan or on any plant-based diet or anything like that. Well, the general plant-based diet here was associated with 21% lower risk. And of course, the healthier one was associated with 55% lower risk, but it just shows that the average shift is going to lead to a beneficial result, lower overall risk. 
but just don't drink soda and eat all those processed foods. And of course I have to reiterate that red and processed meats are a class two and one A carcinogen with respect to colorectal cancer. So moving on. While we're on the topic of plant-based diet indexes, which yeah, can be kind of annoying because they're not looking at vegan specific diets, but it's still good to look at the effects of more or less plants. This one in particular is on frailty. No surprise that again, eating unhealthier foods leads to an unhealthy result. Healthier foods leads to a healthy result. The results were that the highest versus lowest healthy plant-based index was associated with 37% less frailty, but you have a 13% increased risk of frailty for less healthy plant-based foods. And get this, a 27% increase for animal foods. So animal foods were associated with frailty. Meat equals weak. But that is a really important point because I don't think it made any headlines that frailty and high animal product consumption were associated, but let's keep moving on to the next one. This study was a trial that pinned low carb vegan diets up against low carb vegetarian diets, and it was three months long. It wasn't the longest one in the world, so it's not a surprise that we didn't see dramatic differences between the two. They say, quote, low carbohydrate vegan and vegetarian diets reduced body weight, improved glycemic control and blood pressure, but the more plant-based diet had greater potential reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We'll get to the environmental stuff in a bit, but they said that it was similar between groups in all of those things, but it is worth mentioning and distinguishing that the vegan group had a statistically significant higher level of weight loss, even though it wasn't like a huge magnitude of weight loss. So who knows if the study was longer, that could have become more exaggerated. But I think it highlights that low carb vegan diets are a great alternative to people who are trying to just go low carb in general and thinking they need to slam down the meat and just blasting their LDL levels through the roof. But as promised to the environmental studies. We just have a couple here, and the first one is interesting from Italy, in particular, Roman school lunches and their environmental impacts, looking at different dietary patterns and different really school menus. They open with, quote, the food system is a primary sector of the economy that accounts for 34% of total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, anthropogenic meaning created by humans. It's funny because toward the beginning of the study and at the end of the study, they highlight that a more eco-friendly planned omnivorous diet would save greenhouse gas emissions, obviously, but they are not fully emphasizing how much better a vegan diet is than all of the other diets that they looked at here. We can look at the actual emissions per week. They say, quote, the weekly greenhouse gas emission average of the menu of Rome is equal to 5,841 grams of CO2 equivalent. That's really the baseline that we're looking at here. But then we can look at their optimized vegan diet that they came up with. And whammo, we're down to 1,742 grams of CO2 equivalent per week. So yeah, we're talking about a 70% reduction from baseline, which is really almost twice as good as their optimized omnivorous diet. However, I had to calculate that based off of their figures in the study. They never explicitly said that, probably because they thought it was too hard line of a message that people wouldn't want to hear. That's my guess. And if we wanna just sloppily apply that reduction to that initial claim that they made of 34% of emissions coming from the food sector, well, a vegan switch overall, well, that would result in a 23% reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions by humanity, worth it. And for our last study, we have another one sort of along these lines, looking at different types of protein and their emissions, as well as a little bit of a look at their health effects. Now, they didn't actually look at a zero meat scenario here, but their findings were no surprise. Quote, the profile including the lowest protein from meat had the lowest impact on almost all environmental indicators and had the lowest long-term risk. And they have some interesting charts that show, you know, which types of proteins affect which sectors of the environment the most. And they also say, quote, we found that the protein profile with low contribution from meat has great potential for human health. In the end, we don't really need to summarize or reiterate anything too much. I was definitely surprised that it's possible that we have a 100% accurate vegan test. I definitely wanna just give it out to people that say they're vegan and not vegan and just see where they land, see if it would actually work. I'm also happy to see all those other trends and let me know down below what you think about these or any studies sticking out to you, anything that you want me to do a full video on, like for example, those fat-based cytokines and their effect on health and metabolic syndrome, that could be interesting. And finally, once again, thank you to Toodaloo 
for sponsoring this video. They're a delicious way to snack and get your adaptogens at the same time. Snack adaptogens? I don't know. Is that catchy? No, it's not catchy. But if you want to try it, you can of course click the link below and get $5 off your first one. That's toodaloo.com slash Mike, M-I-C. Feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And thank you for watching. I'm going to keep eating. That's my new outro. See ya.